Jackson over to offer. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you excited about Sunday school? Are you excited about the Lord? Praise the Lord. Well, we want to get started today, and when we, uh, as we're getting started, we want to have prayer. How many is sick in body? Anybody got a need? Anybody got one, two? All right, three, four. Let's all stand and let's pray for these needs this morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, asking, Lord, to touch each and every one of these needs today. Lord, you see each of these people. You see the ones that's on the website, Lord, that is in need today. Lord, we want you to touch each and every one of these. We want you to touch our Sunday school today. Touch the words that are coming forth from your word, Lord, to bless, to lift us up, and encourage us. Lord, we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. And we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, if Sister Holly will come, we're going to uh, sing. My wife is going to lead you and she's going to play. But we're going to sing the first two verses of Are You Washed in the Blood? How many, how many likes being washed in the blood of the Lamb? Washed your sins away. God bless you. Just the first two verses. Yeah. Ready when you are, Sister Holly. Oh, oh you don't have to do now. Well, this is an old one. Most of everybody probably knows the words. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Focus is uh, many people, and I've got to get all my notes here together. Many people have risen to productive lives and leadership roles as a result of someone daring to believe in them. How many here today? has had somebody to believe in you and, and gave you a chance. 
Well, I'm going I'm to tell you two different stories here real quick, real short, and then my wife is going to read the lessons because I've got a lot of scripture to go over with you about Barnabas and Paul. When we went to Brother Don Johnson's church, there was a man there by the name of Russell Oder. Brother Oder came to me when I got about 19 years old, and he said, would you like to have a job? And I said, yes, sir, I would. And uh, I went to work in a box factory. We made cartons like Jack Pirtle's chicken and gift boxes like Goldsmith, Shangberg's, all of y'all that can remember those that are out of business today. And uh, what happened was, was he believed in me. He got behind me. And through the years, I worked there 27 years, through the years, he kept pushing me. How many gets mad at somebody when they push you a little bit? Working in a job. Well, what he was doing, he was grooming me to take his place when he retired. So the last 10 years that I worked at that company, I was the supervisor. But yet at 19 years old, I did not see that. And then later on, as I matured a little more, I had a mentor, Brother Don Johnson, Brother L.H. Benson. How many y'all know Brother Benson? Was our superintendent for quite a while. Brother David Flowers. All of these men kept pushing me and after me to do just a little bit more for God. Work in God's house more. Do more. Brother Johnson as being my pastor. He would say, now Brother Ash, we want you to teach Sunday school. We want you to be a bus driver. We want you to be the bus captain. Then we want you to be over Sunday school and we want you to do this. What was he doing? I didn't realize this, but God had called me to pastor a church and Brother Johnson was help grooming me to take that position one day. How many thanks God for a mediator that helped you along? Without that person, you wouldn't become who you are today. Well, did you know we wouldn't have Paul or Saul as he started out if it hadn't have been for Barnabas? In our lesson today, it tells us that none of the disciples, none of the Christians that knew anything about Saul did not want to have anything to do with this man. Anybody know why? He persecuted the church. He had people killed. He had people in prison. He done everything he could. And when he was going to the road of Damascus, if it, uh, if it had not been for the Lord stopping him in his tracks, he had letters from the high priest to get everybody, to round up everybody in Damascus and bring them back to put them in prison. So without Barnabas, we would really be in trouble because we wouldn't have the 14 books of the New Testament. We'd have a very short version in the New Testament. They would be nothing there hardly. But because of what Barnabas did, Barnabas stood up and believed in the man. How many believes in a person today? How many believe somebody's got potential? You see that potential in them and you want to help them. If you do, that's what we need to do is grab a hold of that individual person or more. Uh, Barnabas went with uh, John Mark also. It just wasn't with Paul. He went with somebody else after Paul went on his own way. But you've got to reach out and keep helping. That's how we build a church. That's how we reach people, is one person at a time. I've had many people ask me, Brother Ash, how do you build a church? The only way I know to build a church is one person at a time. You work with that person till you get them rooted and grounded, and then you go to the next person. And if you get more, like our church is going through right now, this growth spurt, well, Brother Hunt is 
getting different ones to help different ones. In Bible teaching, Bible lessons, whatever you can grab a hold of, the Word of God. I tell you what, to, when I started our little church in Arlington a bunch of years ago, I won't say how many, but a bunch of years ago, we did not have the ammunition that we've got today in the church. When we started, I think they might have been one Bible lesson that you could give to newcomers. And now me and my wife, I don't know if we've got all of them, but I counted in the office the other day, I think we've got eight different Bible lessons that you can give to people, new converts. I'm gonna let my wife read the lesson and then we're gonna go on. He didn't ask for a comment, but if it wasn't for the Lord on my side, where would it be? He made me think of that. Acts 9, 27 is the focus verse. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. The lesson text is Acts 9, 26 through 31. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and brought him forth, sent him forth to Tars, Tarsus. Excuse me. Then had the churches rested throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, Samaria, and were edified, and walked in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Acts eleven twenty five through 26. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year was where they assembled together with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Acts 13, 1 through 2 and 42 through 30, 43. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon that were called Niger and Lucas and Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetric and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that those words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God praise the Lord the title today is the merciful mediator well I looked these up merciful and Webster all he had under merciful is full of mercy now how many in here today you have full of mercy for your fellow man. Think about this. Now you're a Christian. A Christian means Christ-like. We are supposed to be full of mercy. And I hate to tell you this. We're supposed to be merciful. Even to the ones in the world. We don't like to do it sometimes. But we are supposed to. I'll give you a little, uh, a little incident, or, or a little joke, actually. Uh, my cousin, she likes to drive fast, and I won't name which cousin. Some of y'all might know her. But uh, she likes to drive fast. All she knows is to pedal all the way to the floorboard. And uh, sometimes somebody will cut her off or something, or go around her or whatever, and that person will give her the finger as they going by 
And she said, that really upsets me. And she said, but you know what? They're not even worth a, a full bird all the way back. So what I do is I just give them a feather. <laughs> she is obtaining mercy. She don't want to act like them. So she gives mercy back. Well, then mediator, and I looked that up, and it, it says a person who mediates, a person that mediates between two parties. Now, here we go. How many of us is glad that Jesus Christ is our mediator? If it hadn't have been for him hanging on the cross, none of us would be in church today because he is the great mediator. Well, you know what? We're right under the Lord. When we become a Christian, we become automatically a mediator for somebody else. And if we will take that person and help them, and sometimes we might not even like them. How many goes to church with somebody you don't like? You love them, but you don't like them. Uh, see there? I got hands coming up everywhere. <laughs> now I got, you, I, got, I got you clicking now. Now they're going, now who doesn't like me? <laughs> but you know what? It doesn't matter who likes you or who don't like you. I'm glad that the Lord loves me. Isn't that what counts the most? The Lord loving us. The Lord took us out of the miry clay and put us on the solid rock. That cornerstone that wasn't worth anything to the builders at first, it became the chief cornerstone and it helps hold up the building. I'm glad I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm glad that I've got a mediator in my life, spiritually and physically, because if I did not have every one of y'all and the Lord, I don't know if I could make it today in the shape the world is in. Can you give the Lord a praise right now? And we're here today to talk mostly about two men, and I'm gonna uh, bring to you first Barnabas. Our Sunday school lesson sort of brings Paul out first, but I wanna bring Barnabas. Barnabas was a surname for Joseph. He was a Levite from Cyprus. He became a Christian in the early days after Jesus ascended and became a unusual devout man. Barnabas sold his property and gave the money to help support the poor Christians. When Paul became a Christian, most believers were afraid to accept him, but Barnabas assured them that Paul was truly a believer. Barnabas led the work at Antioch and brought Paul there to help them, the church, are the two of them in the church for a whole year. How many knew that? That Paul was under Barnabas' teaching and helped him for a whole year. Sometimes we don't think we can get people, we, we don't want to get rid of people. Paul had one year. He sat under Barnabas for one year and then the church, it says, sent, him, sent the two men out on a missionary journey. So Barnabas had, had uh, Paul with him on the very first missionary journey. And they took John Mark, which was Barnabas' cousin. And then Paul and Barnabas had words. Now, why do you think that they had words? One, Paul later on, they give us scriptures. There's 31 scriptures with this lesson, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. But eventually, Paul came back to Barnabas and apologized to him for the way he acted toward John Mark. But at first, he did not like John Mark. He didn't want to have anything to really do with John Mark. He didn't think that John Mark could come up, as the old saying is, snuff. He couldn't, he couldn't cut it. But you know what? As time goes on, it, Barnabas proved 
that John Mark had it in him. He just needed a little bit more help. How many times are we ready to give up on somebody? Because of the way they act, the way they talk. Maybe it's the way they live. We don't like the way they live. But you know what? Maybe that person is needing just a little bit more help or a little bit more teaching. Why do you think pastors are so patient and they give everybody a chance after chance after chance after chance? Because you know why? We won't, just like the Lord, pastors want everybody to go to heaven and we want to give them every chance that we can give them to get there. We might not agree with everything and we see things that you don't see and we hear things that you don't hear, but you know what? We keep giving a person a chance after chance after chance because everybody needs that chance to get to heaven. Let's back it up just a little bit here and say, do you have family members that you don't like? You got family members that you don't want to be around because of their lifestyle, their language that they use or whatever. And you hate when it's time to have a family reunion. You know that they're coming just where they can aggravate you. I see a bunch of you laughing and a bunch of you nodding your head. I'm hitting home this morning, ain't I? I'm telling the truth. And it is a fact. But you know what? Because they're kin to you, and I'm not going to go through brothers, sisters, and all of that, but they're kin to you. You don't like them, but you love them, and don't you want them to still go to heaven? That's what we've got to understand as Christians. There's a place right down the road here. If they got the opportunity, they would love to kill every one of us. But do you know what? That same place, we love them and we want to see them go to heaven, don't we? I know some of you want them to go to heaven in different ways than what I'm talking about, but we shouldn't think that way either. We need to thank God that we've got a loving heart, a kind mind, amen? How many in here has got a kind mind today? We've got to realize we've got to be like Barnabas. We've got to love. All right, and then it goes on. My goodness, I'm going to run out of time. With Barnabas, there was complete harmony of the heart, soul, amongst the believers, and shared everything that they had. Not one of them laid claim to possessions as their very own. Now, we're talking about the early church. After Christ went up, after the upper room experience, the church came in unity. And that's where Barnabas came in. He had unity with the people and the apostles preached about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ with great authority and power. You know, I know that you probably get tired. Some of us has been in it. Let's see. I've been in it. Uh, I've had the Holy Ghost and been baptized 47 years. And I haven't got tired of it yet myself, but I know that I'm a preacher so that doesn't, but I'm talking about saints. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many gets tired of that? Now come on, be honest. If you hear it every Sunday, do you get tired of it? Good. I'm glad. Because there's some people that does. Well, y'all always preaching the same thing. Well, the apostles started out preaching nothing but the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all they preached. Everywhere they went, they preached that gospel. They wanted, to know, they wanted the Jews to know, you kill the Lord and Savior. You kill the one that was bringing salvation to his people, and now he turned to the Gentiles. 
Aren't you glad that they gave him up, folks? We are to be standing on top of the pews, shouting with the, our voice as loud as we can because, because they gave it up. We got it. And I'm glad we got it. And Barnabas is part of that. And there was no poverty amongst the believers for those who owned land and houses sold it. Uh-oh. How many of us today would sell our house and give it to the church? The money. Uh, we're talking faith here, ain't we? They're talking, I mean, we're talking faith, faith, faith here. And the apostles distributed it according to the needs of others. They were in charge of it and they passed it out whoever was in need. Now can, can we see that today? Man, we'd have to have all kinds of lawyers and bankers and everything if we did that today with all the laws that we have. Folks, what I'm saying is charity went forth. Now, I'm not saying come and sell your house and give it to the church. If we all did that, the church could build a church of 1,500 or more. But what I am saying is we're supposed to show charity. We're supposed to help one another. And you say, well, Brother Ash, is it finance? No. Prayers, fasting, when a brother or sister's in need, you pray for them. How many would like to see healings go forth? Well, how many's praying for healing to go forth? How many would like to see more people saved? Well, how many people are praying for salvation? The apostles, the apostles were praying for healing and salvation because a lot of the apostles were disciples and they were followers of Christ and they seen what the Lord did and they wanted that portion that God had for them and they wanted to show that like Peter and them going into the temple and there was a lame man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give thy thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately they took his hand, raised him up, and then he went into the synagogue leaping and praising God. Why? Because of charity and because of faith. And this is what Barnabas was going through himself because he came after the Lord had gone up. But now he's got a young man with him that he's training and he's seeing these things. And later on here in just a minute, we're going to find out that Paul, when he really got a hold of this thing, the apostolic way, when he really got a hold of it, the Bible said that Paul spoke with boldness. And I want to stop there for a minute for this reason, how many of us are speaking with boldness nowadays? Where I don't run out of time on this, why I'm on boldness. How many loves your freedom? How many is sticking up for your freedom? How many is speaking out about our freedom? A lot of us are not and we're losing our freedom one piece at a time. If you don't think so, go to Washington and listen to them talk. They're wanting to take more and more and more away from us. We've got one person that's running for president. She would like to, and I just opened my mouth, didn't I? Uh, she wants to take everything away from us where we don't have anything. But if us Christians don't stand up, and make it known we will lose everything and you think we're in trouble now. But what I'm talking about, these guys here, these disciples, these apostles, Barnabas and Paul, all of them had the whole Roman Empire against them, but yet they stood up for the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ and they preached it. It didn't matter if they went to jail, if 
Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. It didn't matter to them if they had to die for the Lord. They knew that their reward was gain if they died for him. So we need to realize today that we need to stand up for our freedom in this country because if we don't, we're going to lose our rights to go to church eventually. We need to let the world know that Christians are tired of taking this mess and that we're going to stand up like Barnabas and Paul and all of the apostles and get a hold of this and we're going to see signs and wonders. We're going to see the great things of God move in our land again because we're going to start turning our land back to the Lord and giving it to him and say, Lord, here we are. We want to get rid of all of our sin. We want to get rid of everything to where that we can be your child once again and see the miracles happen in your kingdom. Amen? I'm sorry. I get excited. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching. Woo, glory. In the book of Job, with uh, talking about Barnabas, they, they bring this out, that in the book of Job 28, 1 and 2, then 6, 10 through 11, Job was searching for wisdom. And the way that he explained this to his friends is he used a miner that mines out gold and silver and and precious stones, diamonds. And he said, I want to be able to seek after wisdom as a miner seeks after precious stones. Have you ever thought about that? Don't that just get you right here? Because Maybe most of y'all probably think, well, they just go in there with big machines and drill holes and, and do all this kind of stuff. Well, the old guys back 100 years ago or so, they used sledgehammers and chisels and, and picks, and they went into the side of a mountain when they found gold or silver or precious stones, and they actually took it out. They had to work at it. Well, what Job was saying, if we want the kind of wisdom that we really want from God, we've got to work at it. And how do we get that wisdom? How many knows how to get that wisdom? You pray, you fast, you get on your knees, you cry, you holler, you yell, you do everything that you can to get a hold of God to give the wisdom that you want. Some of y'all are looking at me a little strange. Let me go a different route then maybe that the Lord, the Lord just gave me. Praise the Lord. Is Solomon. When the Lord came to Solomon, he said, Solomon, he said, as the new king of Israel, what do you want? Most guys would have said silver and gold and the world. But Solomon said, Lord, I want wisdom. I want knowledge. I want understanding. And the Lord gave it to Solomon. And one of Solomon's first duties as king, two women came up to him. And both of them wanted the same baby. And Solomon said, cut it in half. And the real mother said, oh no, give it, let her, let the baby live, give it to her. Then Solomon knew who the real mother was. Because a mama don't want to see her baby die. She, don't, she will not give her baby up if she can help it. So what I'm getting at, Barnabas used wisdom with Paul. Barnabas knew when to cut Paul loose. Because Barnabas, as a good mediator knew that Paul was faster than him, smarter than him in some ways. He was a go-getter. 
He wanted to move a lot faster after things. And so finally, Barnabas said, okay, we need to go our separate ways. How many times do we want to give up somebody? To me, and maybe Brother Hunt, it's hard to give up people. You love people. To, to be a pastor, now I'm going to be with you, be honest with you. To be a pastor, you've got to love people. You've got to love people. It don't matter their actions. Their, uh, you love them because you want to see them go to heaven. And when you lose them, de- depends on the circumstance. When you lose them, they're still sort of your, if it's okay for me to use this, your child. And, and you worry about them. Are, are they going to do good at the next church? Are they going to go to church? Are they going to go? And it's left up to the individual person on how you feel when they leave. So a pastor a lot of times don't want to lose somebody, but then you've got circumstances where they become uh, preachers and pastors. Uh, Sometimes it's business. Their business moves them to another location. It's too far away. Uh, All different kinds of circumstances. But what you get a hold of is this, is that you've got to pray for them and you've got to put your trust in God for them that God is going to look after them. Does everybody get that? Because we need to realize that God is going to protect all of us. Before I give a description to Paul and and get you to laugh and everything, here is something that was in our lesson today that I want to share with you. It says, one man in particular embodied everything in the book of Acts is about the Apostle Paul. And Paul was not merely... Pentecostal, he was in the sense Pentecostal itself. Now think about this. Paul is actually Pentecost itself. Well, if you think about it, Paul was Pentecostal to us because Paul is the one that brought the Pentecostal message to the Gentiles. He went everywhere. All of his missionary journeys, he went to save the Gentiles. So Paul really, for us, is Pentecost by leading all of our ancestors and us to the Lord. Paul loved this message that much. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I want to get you thinking. How many in here really loves the Pentecostal message. I had Brother Tony Roberts ask me one time, me and him was talking, he said, Brother Ash, he said, I got a question for you. And I said, yes, sir. He said, are you Pentecostal? And I said, sir, I'm Pentecostal all the way to the mire of my bones. I said, I love the Lord that much. And I do. I don't want to give this gospel up for nothing or nobody. And you say, well, Brother Ash, would you die for it? Well, who really wants to die? But if I had to die for a cause, this would be the cause that it would be worth it. Because think about it. If you die for Christ, heaven is your gain. And we've had folks to die for this country. We've had folks to die for drugs. We've had folks to drive for alcohol you read it see it on the news people dying of alcohol poisoning they dying for their God ain't they it, didn't they turn it into their God and they died for it well why what would make the difference for us if we died for Christ he died for us first alright 
He was all things to all men. He left behind his deep-seating hatred and learned to love the kind of people that he despised. That was Paul. When he was Saul, he hated the Christians. Why did he hate the Christians? Because that was embedded in him from a young man. Because in Philippians 3 and 6, he was born Saul, and like King Saul, more than a millennium before, he was born to the tribe of Benjamin. His uh, Greek-speaking associates nicknamed him Paul, which means small or tiny. So Paul was a tiny man. Not only was he a tiny man, his, his appearance as a little, a little man statued, he had thin hair on his head, he was bow-legged, he had one eyebrow that went all the way across his head, and his nose was crooked. Now, when you've seen somebody walking down through there like this, and he has one big eyebrow, his nose is crooked like this, you're going to do one or two things, right? You're going to either laugh at him, or you're going to run from him. And most people probably laughed at him. But do you know Paul took that advantage and won souls with it? And you know, that's one thing we all need to, to realize. How many here can speak perfect English? I mean, perfect English. You never make a mistake. You never mispronounce a word. Never. Well, some people pick on that. They're worse off than you are. But they'll pick up on that and then they'll laugh at you about you mispronouncing words. Or they don't like the way you comb your hair. Or I know this when I was in high school. Of course, that's been many years ago. Many years ago. People, uh, kids would make fun of Pentecostal girls. They didn't wear makeup. They had long dresses on. They fixed their hair up most of the time, didn't wear it down. And, but at the same time, I also watched and learned this. Whenever they had a disaster in their house, or what teenagers thought were disasters, where they went is to the Pentecostal girls to pray for them. They made fun of them, but then they turned around and asked you to pray for them because they were, oh my God, Johnny left me. And I don't know what to do. Would you come and pray for me, please? Well, you know what? The world is doing that today, but as we get older, we don't pay as much attention to it. I heard this joke one time, and I'll tell you real quick, and I'll go on. This man and this woman, they dated. They dated for 15 years. After 15 years, the man asked the lady to marry him. So they got married. Well, on their honeymoon, she said, Honey, I got to get ready for bed. He said, Okay. So he goes ahead and lays down in the bed and puts two pillows up. And he's just patting away at his pillows and he gets situated, you know. And he's watching his new bride. And she's standing at the dresser. And she takes off part of her hair and puts it on the dresser. She takes a hearing aid out, puts it on the dresser. Takes her teeth out, puts this on the dresser. And she does two or three more things and she comes to bed and he says, honey, are you sure that's all? He said, I'm beginning to wonder if there's anything left. That's the reason why as you get older with your bride, you don't think of things anymore because you got older together. That's the way we are with the church. 
as we get older, we don't pay attention to a lot of these things that go on, like I just mentioned about Paul, being bow-legged and hook-nosed and one... Brother East, that had to be a sight. One eyebrow all the way across your forehead. Can you imagine somebody looking like that? But do you know what? God took somebody like that and won souls. We need to realize that we're blessed. We are a blessed people. We are a peculiar people. Let me read you some scriptures real quick before we go on. That the Lord laid on my heart with part of this lesson. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with verse 18, it said, What is my reward then, verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself a servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jew I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law and without as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Did y'all catch that? Paul became all things to all men. What he was saying, if you're rich, I'm rich and I can talk to you. If you're educated, I'm educated and I can talk to you. If you're poor, I'm poor and I can talk to you. If you can sing, I can sing and I can talk to you. If you can't talk, but country talk, I can can talk country talk because he wanted to be all things to all men and then it closes with where I might save some not all but some he became everything that he could to where that he had a chance to win all men so you know what we are to do as Christians number one we are to be Friends to each other in this church. We are to love each other, respect each other, uplift each other, encourage each other, and do all that we can for each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. But then, as a visitor comes into this church, we are to be like bees after honey. We are to swarm them and make them feel at home and do everything we can to help win them to the Lord. And if we'll do that, we can fill a church to 500 and probably build 15 or 20 daughter works if we'll work it right with the Lord. Let us all become all to all people that we can win them to the Lord. Amen? I'm almost out of time. I want to read uh, Galatians 5 and 22. And this is talking about the spiritual part of Barnabas, which is also talking the spiritual part of all of us. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against, Such there is no law. They can't make a law for none of them. But now here's what I want to ask you before I close and then anybody got any comments, you're more than welcome to make them. How many in here has got all of those covered? 
You got all of them. You want me to read them to you one more time? Love. How many has got love covered? Joy. How many has got joy covered? Peace. How many has got peace in here? How many can go to bed at night and go to sleep? With not a problem. No problem. Praise the Lord. All right, now we're going to get to the tough ones. How many has got long suffering? How many has got gentleness? Goodness? How many in here are good? Man, we got some bad folks, Brother Hunt. How many has got faith? How many has got meekness? And how many has got temperance? Praise the Lord. I got about three people to raise their hands on all of them. Man, they're holier than I am, man. Because <laughs> I got a problem with a few of them. <laughs> how many loves Paul and Barnabas? God bless you. We have got... Uh, Oh, about four minutes. Anybody got any comments? If I'm looking at that right. Oh, I'm sorry. It's glare. Anybody got any comments? All right. Well, then we're going to change the order of the service. Everybody stand. We'll.